We're here with our friend, uh, Dr. Tim Kaczynski. Uh, welcome, Tim. Hi, how are you doing today? Good. Uh, we've, we've received your scan of your, your patient, and uh, we've uh, segmented it, and we're ready to go review the case. It may turn out a little different from what your original RX was the way, uh, based on how the patient presents. Right. So just to review the, the, uh, the different views we have here for our audience, uh, I'll just go quickly. What we have is on the lower right, we have a 3D rendering of the patient. So you can see the patient's uh, prosthesis there. We can take that away and you can see the patient's ridge and that starts giving you an idea of uh, where we're running into our issue is, is the uh, very uh, atrophic ridge in the, uh, the premaxilla area. If we go up above, we have uh, axial slices and we can scroll up and down those slices and again, you can, we'll talk about that as we go through it. If you look at this, you have a yellow curve that goes along the arch the blue line cross-secs it, and that's what we're looking at here is a cross-section. And so we can scroll along that yellow arch and look at uh, various cross-sections of the ridge. And on, on the lower left is a panoramic type of view. Okay, so that's just a, a quick review of it. So from your original RX, the, the plan was to uh, place uh, four implants, do a locator overdenture, and place the implants in the, uh, in, I believe, in the, sec in the second premolar in the canine areas. Right. And uh, that may have to change slightly. Let's go through it and see what you think. So we've tentatively dropped some implants in where, where we could find some bone, and that may, that may change the, uh, the way we go here. So let's start on the patient's upper right in the number three area. So if, if, uh, we'll walk around the uh, arch first and just show you what you have as far as the amount of bone to work with. So you, you can see in the three, the three area there's some bone. Now we're just going mesial. Now we're in the number five area. And as we go forward, it starts getting a very, very knife edge. Okay. This was the surprise to me uh, after reviewing the panoramic, which we would normally do looking at things in two dimensions. It looked like we had tons of bone to work with. And the ridge was a little deceiving also. By palpating the ridge, it appeared that we had good width of bone too. So the CT diagnosis in this case is just remarkable. Um, it's um, unparalleled. We, I would have made a big mistake if I had gone with my original treatment plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, you can see over here, which basically you have a, a similar situation on the right and the left. You've got, a, you got bone to work with in the, uh, the premolar molar area, but the, uh, anything uh, anterior to that is, is very thin. Okay, and this is probably the panoramic view is as good as any. You can see you, you got you got nice clear sinuses, but you can see where where the sinuses drop down. You do have an amount of bone to work with right here, in the premolar molar area, and the same thing on this side. Okay, so let's just start on the uh, we'll start in the on the patient's upper right, and see if where you would like to have your implant. We'll go ahead and blow the cross section up. Okay, so here you can see, you can obviously see this is the floor of your sinus. This is your uh, triangle of bone you have to work with, and it looks like you've got a, a pretty good amount of bone to work with. Right now, the, the plant you had, had requested were Cybron implants, so what we've planned are Cybron Pro. And number three is a 4.8 by 9. And the question was whether you want to you stay with this size. Did you have any intention of going up into the sinus? Uh, particularly has, has um, uh, spoken about um, some sinus um, irritations in the past. So I'd prefer to not to have to tent that if I can, and that's why I think a 9 millimeter would be ideal in that situation. Okay. And then you can see the cross-section here of the, uh, of the tooth, and it, the restorative space is the yellow, so you're coming right out, right out through the center of the tooth. Um, as far as the relationship of the top of the implant to the crest of the bone, is that where you'd like to see it? Right. Right at the crest. Okay. Okay. And it looks like you're engaging the floor of the sinus, so I think you have good stability. All right. Any other any other thoughts or concerns on on placement for number three? No, that that looks that looks perfect. Okay. So we'll just go ahead and move mesial. Okay. This is the number five area. Now it's a uh, a generic view. 
uh, based on what Cybron has provided materialized. So you can still see your, your diameter and your length. You just don't have a, as realistic a view as you had with the, the other diameter. Okay, so here is number five. And the size that's in there right now is a 3.5 millimeter diameter by 13 millimeter length. So a 3.5 by 13. It looks like you do have a nice amount of bone to work with. Um, and, our, and the most important thing here is that we, we try to keep those implants parallel to each other um, uh, as much as possible. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, the other thing that we have, we can talk about once we figure out where you want to have uh, place your implants is, is how you would like to restore them. Uh, bar, we splint them with bars, or if you really want to go ahead, freestanding, so we can have that discussion too. Um, as far as placement of this implant, any other changes you'd like to see on that? No, that looks, that looks good too, right at the crest of the ridge. Mm -hmm. uh, nice, long 13 millimeter implant is, is ideal. The you know, other thing that I think of is maybe uh, Bring this up a little bit this way. Okay. Now you do have the, the gray is a millimeter and a half, so you do have a good millimeter and a half of bone on the buckle. A little thinner on the on the paddle. You okay with this position? I'm, yeah, I'm fine with that. Yep. Uh, okay. So we'll go ahead and go out of that view. Okay, now if we keep going mesial. Then you can see where things fall off. I'm not sure if you'd be able to get anything any further mesial than the one we have planned uh, without doing some grafting or else uh, ridge splitting. Okay. We'll go around to the other side. This is the number 12 area. Okay. Basically the same situation as you had on the other side. Looks like a, a reasonable amount of bone. And any uh, any thoughts or changes on the position of this implant? Again, 3.5 by 13 millimeter gives us really good depth. Mm -hmm. okay. and stability. All right. Okay with that position? Yes. Okay. And this is our number 14. And the size of that implant is a 4.8 by 11, so you're able to get a little bit longer implant than you did on the other side. Right. Okay. And basically the same situation. Okay. So you're okay with those. And if we look, add the restorative space so you can see you're coming straight out of the implants where you're coming out, those would be the positions. So then it brings up a discussion as far as um, your plan for restoring this case. Well, originally, um, the, the, this patient in particular has lower implants that she had 20, 25 years uh, ago and has always wanted something in the, in the upper ridge. She's relatively young. She's 57 years old or 58 years old and um, is concerned about her future with her denture. It's having to be relined. Uh, quite frequently and, and she is concerned. Um, our thought process was placing some implants would give her some stability and, and maintenance of the bone. Normal, in a normal situation, again, looking at the panoramic and my initial diagnosis was that we put implants in the four and six area and 11 and 13 area and maybe do some freestanding locators, keep it very simple. But now that necessity is going to make us place the implants more, more posterior, um, the way I look at it is I have two options. I could um, conceivably continue with my plan of locators, but if that were the case, then I would have to have a full pallet in the denture. Now, that's not the end of the world, but again, a patient's going through this process would like to have a palletless prosthesis, if at all possible. The other, the other solution to this is, um, is to fabricate or connect the implants right and left with bars, which is pretty traditional or pretty conventional as far as the mac maxilla goes anyways. Um, have a right and left bar connecting the implants and having some kind of an extension, uh, mesial and distal, uh, with either ERAs or locators or some type of other uh, attachment um, to retain a palletless denture. And I think that's what the patient would like, uh, if at all possible. And I think with, with good placement of implants and good stability, uh, good initial stability of the, Im of the implant, um, good position, good length, good width, um, probably a bar and a removable maxillary palletless denture would be ideal for this patient. Okay, a couple of uh, 
uh, thoughts from the laboratory side is, and get your, your uh, opinion on this, is um, we, I, I agree we could splint uh, these uh, bilaterally with, with bars, so we have one bar over here, and, and then we could do it yeah, two ways. We could either uh, with we have locators, we have CAD CAM bars, we would, we would fabricate, and then we can put a we could put a locator in between the implants, and then extend one off the off the mesial, or we could extend one off the mesial and one off the distal. Uh, the distal might be more difficult because we're getting pretty far back there. So. Right, and that that way you have uh, you know the less of a cantilever the better. So as long as we have five millimeters between the implants, then we can yeah. put a locator in between. So the thought would be, do a CAD CAM bar here with a locator. In between and one cantilever off the mesial to give to give some anterior support, Correct. and the same thing over here. And then as far as going uh, palatless uh, for maxillary overdenture, then the other thing we would recommend would be um, to have a uh, a cast framework yes. here for strength. And, 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 the, and the patient too, Brad. Not to interject, but um, when we say palatless, we're, we're still talking a fair amount of, of tissue support here. Um, we're not removing the entire palate, um, but enough that the patient doesn't have a gagging reflex and we don't really need a post dam uh, in, that, in, in the denture. Right, it'd be more of a horseshoe than a, than a right. true palatless, so it'd be more along, along this line. Exactly. Okay, very good. I think that's a, that's a good solution. Excellent. Okay, great. Well, I sure appreciate your time. And then, so the next step would be that uh, you would go ahead and uh, you can download and view the plan. And then when you're ready to accept it, go ahead and click accept on your online account. And then we'll go ahead and order your surgery guide and we'll proceed from there. Okay, very good. Thanks for your time.